Hello everyone, uh, my name is Domon Kosh Tanchani, but in America they used to call me Dominic because it's the Hungarian, Domon Kosh is the Hungarian name of Dominic. I am, as I already said, I'm from Hungary and uh, I'm working for two companies. One is called Net Academia, who is the official partner of EC Council in Hungary. And the second one is called Skipbug Labs. And this is a new startup company in Hungary. We just started it with some of my friends and we are working on a uh, web vulnerability scanner software. And here you can see my email address, or um, if you want to contact me, just uh, come here after the presentation. I will give you a business card for sure uh, to stay in touch. So this is the presentation is called Everything You Need to Know About Wireless Security. But before we get to the, uh, get to the theory and all the boring PowerPoint stuff I would like to show you today, uh, uh, there's going to be a story around this whole presentation, and this we call it the challenge. And our challenge was to participate in a G8 meeting, a G8 meeting gala dinner, using only uh, uh, wireless hacking. So in our case, it's going to be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RFID, DEC, and uh, GSM in parentheses, because here in the USA we cannot do GSM, sadly, because uh, in, in the USA, GSM carriers using a different frequency. But uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about GSM, but it's still there. It's a possibility to hack GSM since uh, 2010, as you might know, on the C triple and triple C conference, they presented the GSM hacking. So just about the G8 meeting, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar what the G8 meeting is. So just the uh, so-called best economical uh, countries and actually the representatives are meeting. And it, it is a pretty high. Uh, High secure, highly secured meeting, and as you can see, I, I'm pretty sure you recognize that guy in the middle. Yeah, so that's that's what we're talking about. We're trying to hack in such a dinner using only Wi-Fi. So just talk a little bit about the location of G8. Uh, this time it was in France, Deauville, and uh, what we did is, uh, as you can see, the place is there. It's uh, it's actually under the surface, but that that's the place we're trying to hack into, and you can see us. That's us. Uh, we found a nice little hotel next to next to the place, and we were able to do some wireless hacking even from that distance. Uh, so yeah, it's the International Center of Deauville in France. And this is a quote from Wikipedia talking about the G8 security security measures. So security planning was designed to ensure that the summit's formal agenda can remain the primary focus of the attendance discussions, but effectively this meant converting the seaside resort into a fortress for the G8 meeting. Well, we're gonna see how, how, how well they, uh, they did on this job. Okay, let's get back to the PowerPoint stuff, the theory. Uh, just a quick summary of what I would like to talk about today. Uh, first of all, radio network, just a really quick introduction of why we're doing radio network, uh, how radio network started. Then uh, I identified four misconceptions in radio security and what are these and, uh, and uh, why, are they, why are they really bad, uh, bad regarding security. And then uh, I would like to give you a hands-on, actually a real live demo about uh, four techniques that were discovered in the past five or ten years. So there's not going to be any zero-day wireless exploits in here. I I'm telling you right now, so if you want to leave the room, you can go. I'm just kidding. So it's just about uh, stuff that other researchers found, and we are just trying to recreate it and demo it for you, so you can see it with your own eyes, what is possible right now by only using wireless techniques. And in the end, uh, what should we expect in the future in the field of radio and wireless network hacking? <coughs> so why radio? Well, I thought this picture is pretty self-explanatory <laughs> about this question. You hate wires too, right? So isn't that... Isn't that pretty awesome that you just walk around in your home with a laptop connected via Wi-Fi and you connect your phone via Bluetooth or even Wi-Fi and then you can just feel how easy it is. So that's pretty much the main idea why people started thinking about using radio uh, even in, I in IT and uh, yeah, that's why they use radio. How to do radio? Well, uh, first they, people thought that okay, we have a protocol and it's working really good on the wires, so why don't we just leave out the wires and let you let, let, uh, use the same protocol and that's it. So isn't that pretty easy? Just put up two radio towers and then we leave out the wire and then we can just use the same protocol. 
Of course, it is not the best idea if you think about it because <coughs> the protocol designed for wires is probably not so secured against uh, what comes on radio. For example, uh, passive sniffing, which is really easy on radio. You, if you're using radio and someone is sniffing it, you probably won't notice it. So that's a problem. But as you can see, even in the RFC 2549 standard, they have this picture showing the aerial extensions of uh, TCP and IP. So they, they already thought about that. So as I already mentioned, a system which is designed for wires is not protected against uh, sniffing. So that, that, that's the main uh, problem with, with this approach. So the people thought about it. OK, let's, let's figure out a solution for that. And let's say, OK, we're going to turn down the transmitting power, and then nobody can sniff us, because it's going to be so small that nobody can sniff us. And then the range is going to be so low. Wow. OK, that is not a solution. That is actually a problem. And here you see two examples of uh, how you can extend radio. And uh, the picture on the left is about Wi-Fi. So 3.8 kilometers, that's around two miles. Uh, and they extended Wi-Fi to for two miles. And the second one is pretty interesting. That is a lake, and it's around the. You can see the line. The line is around half mile long. And can can you guess uh, which radio protocol are they have they extended so long? Just any guesses from the audience? RFID. Someone said RFID. Yeah, so I heard Bluetooth. You got that. Yeah. So Bluetooth, half mile. And how did they do that? I'm oh, sorry. Like that, just using such such a big antenna, you can uh, you can pretty much extend it for for not, I wouldn't say unlimited range, but you can extend it by a lot. So that's not a solution for our problem number one. Okay, problem number three: security by obscurity. I, I think that's not that's not a a radio only thing. In many other uh, IT security related projects, they say that it's secure because it's propriety or we are not going to tell you how it works, so, it's, uh, so you cannot hack it. Well, the, the big example of that is GSM, which, which was really, uh, closed, I would say closed source, but of course it's propriety. And nobody knew how it, was, how it worked, but actually people started reverse engineering it and figured out how it works, and now because of that, we, now we are able to hack GSM. So that was also a misconception in uh, wireless uh, security history because saying, uh, I'm not going to tell you how it works, it's, it never works against hackers, right? So they're always going to reverse engineer, they're always going to try to figure out what's happening. If you have seen the keynote from Charlie Miller, you have seen how long it took him to reverse engineer that MacBook battery and figuring out in the end that it was some kind of uh, small embedded processor and figure out how it works. So it's the same process. Reverse engineering is always going to work, and hackers are going to do it. So don't even think about security by obscurity, because it is not a good countermeasure. And of course, we have problem number four, which is also not closely related to wireless. These are the, the common uh, programming or developing errors, uh, implementation problems, buffer overflows. As you can see, I just got you two snippets from exploit DB showing uh, two uh, buffer overflows in uh, wireless drivers. One is the Broadcom, one is Mad Wi-Fi, so uh, Linux and Windows, both of them is uh, uh, in, in this problem area. And uh, it was basically uh, a good, th these two overflows were really good and useful for hackers because it was possible to get system administrator rights because the, all the drivers are running with system uh, uh, rights. That, that's why if you cause a buffer overflow in them, you are able to hack into the computer and uh, get all the privileges. Okay, let's get back to the challenge because I think that's more exciting. So that's our target. That this is the guy who is, who is letting people in the G8 uh, meeting area. And uh, please welcome my friend, Marcel, who is going to be playing, the, playing and simulating the, the guy who is, who is the gatekeeper guy. So let's just go step by step, I guess. This guy has many, many wireless enabled devices. One of them is a uh, cordless phone, a digitally enhanced cordless phone, which you can see right here. He is using this to communicate with the uh, main, main building or the main office. And uh, right now, he's having a conversation on that phone. So I think he's going to, we're just going to, you know what, we're just going to pass this around. This, and yeah. So you can just listen to the conversation and 
later when we start sniffing it, you will be able to figure out that we are actually listening to that call and I'm not faking it for you. Number two, he has an older Nokia phone. He's sadly a poor guy. He can't, can't afford such a nice, shiny new iPhone that many of us can, or many of you, I would say. And, <laughs> but he has this nice Nokia phone, and he's using it for both private and also for business-related stuff. Uh, sadly, this phone has Bluetooth enabled, and we're going to see how bad this is for, uh, how, this, how bad this is going to be for him. Next one, he has an e-passport reader. Of course, as a gatekeeper for G8, we think you would need an e-passport reader because you have to read all the passwords of delegates coming in, authorizing them, making it possible for them to, uh, to authenticate. And the next one is, he has, of course, a computer. And, oh yeah, he has a passport too. He's showing it for you right now. So he has a computer which he's using together with the e-passport reader to authenticate people and of course he needs a computer which is connected via Wi-Fi to the internet. Okay, let's take the first step. First step is going to be DECT or Digitally Enhanced Cordless Telephones. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these phones because I know that in many households people still are using these phones. So these are the ones you just plug it into the main phone line coming into the house and then you can just walk around in the handset all around the house and it does, and you still have reception, you can talk to people. So since, as you can see on, on my slide, since 2008 it's possible to, to sniff into uh, decked traffic and only using uh, uh, equipment which, which cost me $75 on eBay. And uh, thanks to German researchers, there is an open source driver for Linux and some tools too, making it possible to sniff in. So listening to calls is now possible and as easy as a pie, and I'm just going to show it to you this right now. So let's get out of this PowerPoint and back to my deck machine. Okay, so I'm just going to run my uh, client program and just put up the help. So you can see it has many options, but I'm just going to go for auto recording and just hit enter and let's see what happens. If we got lucky, and I hope we will get lucky, we will see see uh, it happening. If I'm right, it's right now looking around for channels and searching for a base station to associate with. And once it was able to associate with that specific base station, it will be able to sync on the phone call. And as you can see, it already found our call. And if we get lucky, we will be able to hear the sound. If I change the direction, we should be hearing it right now. It's plugged in. Can you turn it up? I got a laugh. Is this the gatekeeper's office? Yes, sir. This is Peter Johnson, G8. People who listen to the phone call, you got the same, yeah? OK. I give you the official list of guests who are going to visit the So what we are seeing right now is with just two comments, I was able to to listen in to a phone call, and we are not going to listen to the home phone call. We recorded it together actually with Marcel, so you know it's it's just us playing. But the main idea is we listened into the phone call and we heard that there is going to be some guests coming in. For example, Jay Bavizi is coming in from the United States to visit the G8 meeting, but also there is going to be a Hungarian guy, and we are thinking about creating. Some, somehow getting into the place instead of the Hungarian. So we would like to sneak into the dinner in the name of that Hungarian guy. So that, that's what we are trying to do. But we still don't know what to, how we can do that. In the phone call, there is also, they mentioning a so-called two-way authentication system or two-step authentication. We don't know what this is yet. So we're just going to keep co continuing with other, uh, other wireless stuff we can do. So let's go to the next step, which is going to be Bluetooth. So I don't know if you are from, probably many of you are familiar with Bluetooth. Just uh, real quick about Bluetooth, it is using 68 channels and it's using frequency hopping, which means it just hops between those 68 channels really fast. This makes sniffing really hard. So even uh, there is only two ways to sniff Bluetooth. One is to have a device which is capable of uh, sniffing all the 68 channels together. and that, that costs you a lot of money. <laughs> or the, the other step is to create a device which is able to synchronize with the Bluetooth devices and keep hopping together with them on those channels. But since we were not able to get such an equipment in here, we're just going to go forward with the implementation problems. And uh, 
Sadly for Marcel, who is our uh, gatekeeper guy, the phone he's using is having a serial channel or debugging channel attached to Bluetooth. And this is a hidden channel, but it's still possible to connect to that hidden channel and execute commands on his phone. So what are we going to do now? It's called blue surfing, actually. I'm just going to change to my backtrack machine here and put it on full screen. Here we go. OK, so I'm just going to bring up the uh, Bluetooth device, HCI up, and just scan around for uh, Bluetooth devices. So if you have Bluetooth enabled on your phone, probably it's going to show up here, just telling you. And once it's finished scanning, we will be able to see uh, this Nokia phone. Oh, yeah, Blackberries. Ah, Someone is using, I guess, maybe a Samsung or something. Hmm. OK, I'm still going to go with my Nokia. Uh, maybe after the presentation, I, we can try to hack into the Blackberry or the other one. <laughs> OK, who is having the Blackberry? Anyone knows? Oh, OK, good. Well, we, we got you. <laughs> OK, now I'm just going to use a tool called Bluebugger. And I'm just going to give it uh, one uh, switch or parameter. And this is the address of the Nokia phone we found. And I would like to read, well, just read first everything. So what happens now, it just logs in. And the address book is sadly empty, but, but you can see the manufacturer is Nokia. Here is a mobile identification, some, some information about the phone, uh, model, uh, revision, email number. You, if you're familiar with G, uh, GSM, you, you might know that this number right here is pretty big. It's, it's pretty uh, useful if you are trying to do nasty stuff in GSM. So just telling that it's possible <coughs> via Bluetooth. But what we are trying to do is extract a text message. So to do a text message, I'm just going to give it the messages command in the end. If we get lucky, and I hope we will get lucky, we will see our text message. Oh, sadly, it's not showing me any text messages. Wow, that's sad. Then I might be able to do an ATCMD because that will be okay. I'm sorry, I pressed. Do it again. Okay, you just disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing about blue background, all this uh, hidden channel, is that uh, the victim does not have to press anything on the phone. So as you can see, I can have the phone right in my hands, not pushing any buttons, and I'm still able to connect to it and you cannot see anything on the screen. Nothing is indicating that someone is connected to this debugger channel. Nothing is indicating that I'm extracting your whole phone book out of the device. So just telling you that, uh, that uh, if he has the, the phone in his pocket, he's not going to notice anything. OK, he's sending a new text message. We'll try if, if that gets through. But it should be here. I'm not sure if Bluebugger is able to. OK, we got the message. Let's see if we can see it from here. OK. Oh, ah, OK. It says, authorization code, I love ethical hackers. So yeah, it says an authorization authentication code. And I'm just going to a little bit fast forward in the story of G8. So we were looking in and the gatekeeper's office were able to see that he's using the, his e-passport reader to read the passport. And then, and then he asked for some authentication code from the guy who was coming in. And then he let the guy in. So we are thinking that the two-step authentication might be indicating that two steps are one is uh, having an e-passport, having a passport that is valid for the specific guy. And the second one is telling the spe special auth authorization code, which the guy receives via SMS from, from the main office. So if that's true, then we already know the authentication code. So we only need to have a e-passport that, uh, that is with our picture. We know the name of the guy. Yeah, we know, we know the name of the guy, too who is coming in from the phone conversation. So we only need an e-password that is uh, matching the guy. So now we're going to fake and uh, create a fake e-password and be able to do that. So let's just think about that before we do it. So third step is RFID. As you can see, the price tag is $50, so not that much. Uh, we are using this uh, $50 um, 
uh, RFID readers. You can buy it from eBay. And we're gonna use use uh, RFID. Uh, we're gonna do a special case of RFID, which is e-passport. And the problem with e-passport is that they have a self-signed certificate, which is uh, guaranteeing the integrity of the passport and uh, of course because if it's self-signed I'm able to create an own uh, certificate and sign the whole e-passport with my certificate and then it will be accepted as a valid e-passport. There is of course a countermeasure against that and this is a main uh, server called PKD which is a public key directory and in this PKD they are storing all the certificates of the countries but since he's connected via Wi-Fi we might be able to reset the connection between him and him and the PKD, allowing us to uh, get authenticated with the fake e-passport. But first, just let's create the e-passport. So I'm just switching to my, my computer doing the e-passport uh, presentation part. And OK, I'm just going to edit this file here. So this is a file. Uh, which you can download from the internet too. I haven't modified anything in, in it yet, but it's ju it's just a simple uh, Python script to generate a new e-passport, actually generating e-passport files, and then later with another script we'll be able to write these files to one of these RFID cards. Which I'm trying to open. Yeah, here we are. So these RFID cards are exactly the same as you can found on the on the passport, and they are uh, RW, so you can read and write them as you wish. So what we're going to do now is, is create fake e passport, and let's go down here. So what would you like to have uh, for the issuing country? I would suggest we would put in Hungary because we are trying to fake Hungarian guy. Okay, you know any Hungarian names? We can put on the e passport. Dominic, thanks, you got me. <laughs> okay, Marcel, what do you think about putting in Dominic? That's good. Joshua Gabo. Joshua Gabo. <laughs> well, okay, put it in. I don't, I don't really care. Can be. Or can be Joshua Pushkash, maybe. <laughs> okay, uh, what would you like to have the nationality to be? Right now we have Nigeria. I don't know if anyone would like to change that. Why don't we just change it to something else? <laughs> USA or Estonia. Estonia. Albania. <laughs> well, I can't create a country, so <laughs> I can just use existing countries. So. <laughs> I'm not sure about the Estonia's the three letter they have. Uh, you know that? I'm not sure. It's on Wikipedia somewhere, but I can't find it now. Sad. You know what? I just put in USA. I think that's gonna work and. What would like to be to be the gender of our guy? Male. Male? Okay. Th thank you so much. It's my e passport, so yeah. What would like to have the passport number? It's right now EH like ethical hacking and then one to one through seven. So it has to have two letters in it and seven numbers if I can count right. So you wanna change that to something? Just change Okay, the just fine. And the birth date and the expiry date, these are the two ones we can change. Right now it says that I have, I was born in 2015, and my password was expired in 2007. That's correct. So you said he's saying that's correct. So if yeah. Yeah, as, as I'm just trying to show you that how easy it is to just change any any field on the password. So that's that's all. Okay, let's change this for example to uh, I don't be just. 77. Okay, so it was expired pretty long ago. And okay, we have to write this down because he, ha he has to know this information for reading the e passport later. So you have a piece of paper? You should have. Actually, I, I think I have some paper here. Oh, you have it. Okay, so the passport number is EH and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7. 5, 6, 7. The birth date is 15, 10, 04. And the expiring date is 770815. You see the things are how it works with e-passports. You have uh, triple dash as, uh, as uh, encryption. But for triple dash, the encryption key is actually the, num the password number, the birth date, and the expi expiring, date, expiring date. So 
as you might think about it, if it's or it's it's printed on your passport, on your valid e passport, not not this one. So it's like printing the key on the passport, which means like printing your PIN number on your credit card, right? So that's how it works. Okay, let's save this file and just run it. And is it generating a new certificate using OpenSSL? And it gave me all the files. So I will just change to this uh, directory and rename those because I have to rename it to be able to write them on the on this card. Putting the card in and using the MRP own key by it was written by a guy called uh, Yeron van Yeek. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. He's a guy from the Netherlands, and he wrote this uh, tool which is capable of uh, writing stuff on such a chip. So I guess it's in the root and then in gen passport and then in dump. And yeah, I guess that's what we need. We have the car down there. And now it's just writing the files. And if we get lucky, and we will get lucky, it has it has now now our card will have all the all the stuff on it. So right now we have an e-passport uh, with my picture on it, but with the guy who is coming in. The name is name of the guy is on the card, and we also know the authentication code. So we know all the two steps. But there is only one more problem with us, and this is that if the guy is able to connect, you guys are all right there. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, you, you, he said you fell asleep, but I'm not believing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, if the guy is able to connect back to the PKD and check our certificate, then we will get busted. So we have to push him down from Wi-Fi. How are we doing this? I'm sure you're familiar with it, but I have a slide, so I want to show it to you. Yeah. So last step is Wi-Fi. As you probably know, Wi-Fi is secure since WPA and WPA2. But there is a way to to deny, create a denial of service situation, uh, regardless of encryption and authentication. This is because all the management package uh, packets are uh, unencrypted, so we are able to create so-called deauthentication packets and just push him down from the Wi-Fi and make it make it impossible for him to connect back to the Wi-Fi. So we're gonna do this right now, switching back to backtrack, and let's just. Bring up my wireless card, starting, uh, start, and it's called VLAN zero. And now I have monitor mode enabled on MAN zero. I'm just killing all these processes that uh, that might be disturbing with this. Okay, let's just start looking around for wireless networks. And as you can see, we have a lot of them. Probably these are all from, from the hotel. But there should be a so-called gatekeeper, and I can see it here. It's right there. So we're just gonna filter through the traffic of this uh, access point to make it easier to see. So say copy, and adding the physical address of the access point to filter out stuff, and adding the channel number, which is channel two, if I'm right. And now we're seeing seeing this access point. And if we wait a little bit, we will be able to see a client <laughs> who is the gatekeeper himself. And here is the, here is the station, uh, the physical address of the station. So I'm just going to open up a new terminal and push him down, saying minus zero means that I'm going to do the authentication. Number of packets, well, we need some time, so let's add. Something like that. That would be fine. <laughs> giving a minus C, giving the uh, client's MAC address. Oops, sorry, I, I guess I messed it up. This is the client, and the other one is the access point. Okay, so copying the client. Then we change this from minus C to minus A. And let's give it the client. And using MAN0. Okay, before I start this, I would like to switch over to that machine by using a VNC and show you that he is connected to the Wi-Fi. Are you ready? Okay. Because he is actually VNCing on me and I'm VNCing on him, so it would create an infinite loop. But here, if he minimizes me on the computer, then if I can, yeah. Okay, he's doing it. He's done. Good. So I'm changing here. 
And you can see it's connected to, get, to the gatekeeper Wi-Fi here. So let's start this command in backtrack. And it started to create, sending the authentication packets. And he is connected now. But if we wait a little bit, he will actually get disconnected if I'm right. As far as I can see on the backtrack machine, the packets are acknowledged. Oh, yeah, yeah. It says connecting, but he's not going to be able to connect back at all because I'm constantly deauthenticating him. So he's trying to do the four-way handshake, which is the, which is in the WPA standards. But before they could finish with the access point, we deauthenticate them. So he's not having internet access, but he hasn't noticed it yet. You see, this icon is so small. It's not. It's not the big deal. So no internet, whatever. Okay. Now what we're going to do is try to get in by. I have my e-passport, I know the authentication, uh, authorization number, so I'm just gonna keep this up so you can see what's happening on the gatekeeper computer. And, okay, Mr. Gatekeeper, please let me in. Now, let's do this one. So, I'm just gonna stand here, and, okay, here is my ID. He's bringing up the virtual machine. Which is uh, which is able to read the read the e password. It's a Ubuntu machine, but it doesn't really matter. He has an e password reader, as I have that too. He's gonna enter the numbers I just told. Uh, he can read from the password, but we just told him right now. Okay, so he's reading. Yeah, he's reading the password, as you can see. Is it gonna take long, please? I wanna get into the dinner. <laughs> no spaces, please. <laughs> the next is the the next number. I think that's the expired date, and then that's the birth date. Or maybe you mix it up, we'll see. But actually, I have the command round somewhere. Whatever, we're gonna see if it's the second number. Okay, hit enter, please. Okay, you just mix it up. You have not. You have. You haven't connected the device. So you have connected it. So let's see if I can debug this. Debug this really fast. That's reading the card. <laughs> Damn. Wow. Seems to be frozen. Good. Then we're gonna just do the old school Windows methods by resetting everything. <laughs> Okay, okay, then I let you do that because otherwise I can't get in. So you see, it's always problematic with government. So you, I, I can create my password, but he cannot read it. So, man, why is this so hard? Oh, my God. Hopefully, I'm not going to push the whole screen down. You, you plugged it in, right? And you plugged it in here? Not yet. Okay. Let's see. Should be good. Now just r run run the same command. No 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 no. Run the PC the scan command. Yeah that one. Yeah. Okay that's good. I remove this better than status unavail unavailable. Put it on there. Okay. It now it's gonna go back. Yeah. That one. And it's. Okay so you probably mis mixed up some stuff. I'm just going to tell you the command. Yeah, I'm in BNC, of course. Here we are. One, two, three, five. First one should be. Hey. Seems that is. Okay, just. Uh, could you just copy this command from here? Okay, I, I will just tell you. I will just tell you. Just delete, delete everything except the bit to seven. So delete everything. But leave to the seven, the EH one two whatever seven. That's yeah, that's so. Leave the seven there, yeah, and then put in four O. I mean O four. One O, one five. One five O eight seven seven. Hit enter. Okay, here we got. Now you can't see it, of course, because I exited from E and C, but. Okay. It's reading the password. <coughs> the BNC is slow. Right. 
So verification successful, and here I am. So this is my e-password which I forged. It's already mine. I deserved it to get the get the hat. And if you just please minimize that window for a sec for me. No, this one. Yeah. So you can see that uh, he used the he used the program called MRP MRP key with verification, and this is a program I created actually, and it is exactly the copy of the program that government agencies are using to read e password. <coughs> so the verification check, which you can see on the bottom, and it says verification successful. If uh, my program says verification successful, this means that all the government agencies' programs are going to say verification successful. So, as you can see, I was able to forge the passport and I'm now I'm able to log in if I say the special authentication yeah. code, which I guess it was I love ethical hackers. Right. Oh, cool. I'm in the G8 meeting and because of, you probably asked us like, did he really do that? Well, sure. We have proof. Mission is completed. Ah, you see those guys? Ah, yeah. Ah, you see he's there, and I'm there. And we have one more, too. Ah, you see he's talking with the French guy, huh? Yeah. So, as you can see, it was pure fictional, but I think it might have ra raised some um, some thoughts in you, and I would be interested to hear that. So I would just Q&A, yeah. Did you have to kidnap the real person so they didn't show up? <laughs> no, that, that's actually, that, that's a flaw in our story. So we, did, we didn't get so far, but uh, we have some ideas. Not kidnapping, but... Uh, something else. Something else. Wait a second. Awesome thought, dude. Thank you. We were there. We were there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, because I, I did actually a black and white version, but it was unnoticeable that we were there. It was just not obvious that we were there. <laughs>